What, what words do you all think of, or what kind of people do you think of when you hear the word entrepreneur? What, the, the, uh, question again. Um, what are some of the words you think about, or the people that you think about when you hear the word entrepreneur? Shortcake. What did you say? Shortcake. Short oh, I thought you said shortcake. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Shark Tank? I immediately think about all the people you see on TV, you know, the big successful people, you know, the Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and people like that. What, may, what do you think makes them different than, well, there's a new movie that I can't remember if it's been released yet or not, um, the McDonald's movie. The Founder. Yeah, The Founder. Yeah. Is it out or is it about to be out? It's in theaters. It is. Um, I'm dying to see that. It looks like it's going to be really, really good. good. Yeah. But do you think of him, though, of Ray Kroc? Or is that, because he went a franchise model. Um, well, I, yeah, I do. I mean, it, it, it was a unique idea, and, and he ran with it, you know? I mean, and it's been proven to be extremely successful. So. That's what came from the idea of the assembly line kitchen. The assembly line kitchen, absolutely. I, and I think that's a good example, because Ray Kroc didn't really have a product that was new and unique. It was a hamburger. Well, and he originally was selling um, milkshake machines. Milkshake machines. Right. Yeah. 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 And not very good either. But he, he, <laughs> he systematized it to, a, to yes. a point where other people could share in his success. And when he allowed them to share in his success, and uh, it was the same everywhere. Sure. Yeah. If you bought a hamburger in on the West right, Coast, with quality control. Right. Yep. And then you knew I could buy one in Wisconsin or Ohio, some in some remote town, and I get the same quality food. It's going to taste the same here as it does over there. And that we really didn't have that in this country ever before. Then. Yeah. Well, and that, I mean, that's the challenge for crafts, and it's certainly the challenge, Tim, for you, as you imagine how you want to be making things in the future, is, okay, we've got students making these products. Is there, you know, how do we build in our quality control to make sure that we have our brand expressed the way that we want, and what does that look like? Which doesn't sound very sexy, by the way. But it started with the, you know, these folks who came up with a great idea and figured out a systemic way um, or a systems way to approach the production and the and the distribution of it. And actually, I think part of the Ray Kroc story is actually when he got the advice to buy the real estate. That's what he actually really figured out. It wasn't really that the hamburgers were that great. It was that he became the the nation's largest real estate holding. They have the best real estate in the country. McDonald's mm -hmm. owns the best real estate in the country. They absolutely do. And the most valuable real estate in the United States is owned by McDonald's. Yeah. And it was also the building of the highway system. Getting all that converged to where he was able to put it at the so highway. He, at the same he, got, time. he got very good information. <laughs> about where ramps were going to be and where towns were going and he bought as early as he could. I mean, it's just like the railroads. I mean, it's the same concept. But even you now, figure out and you buy it ahead of time. If you go to a McDonald's, they, you, they, you know, they won't let you build a McDonald's and own the cheapest piece of real estate. No, You go buy the, the most best. expensive piece of real estate in town, but that's going to be the most profitable yep. place to be. It's just part of the investment. Right, and that's part of what they systemized was how can we guarantee our best sales? What does that property parcel look like? Where does it sit? What's near it? What is it? Does it didn't matter necessarily what the cost was because they knew that if they had this little formula of all of those pieces coming together, number of cars that go by, um, proximity to schools and different things that have you know a captive audience, all of that stuff gets played in, and man, they are they are the masters at it. So. Calculating your risk is part of what we're talking about, and that's part of what um, looking at numbers and looking at products and all of these little details are going into us not just making crazy decisions because we want to make something that looks super cool. There's a lot more tied <coughs> up in what it is that goes into our design process that goes from design to actually producing it. And part of what we're hoping that you get obsessed with in a way that maybe you haven't been before is really looking at that data to understand how do I go from a great idea to executing that idea and when do I take 
a calculated risk because I've done enough research to know that it's really unlikely that this is gonna fail, but it's still risky and maybe not everybody would do this, but I've done enough research to believe that this is worth the challenge and worth the, worth the what's the worst thing that could happen on the other side. So hopefully part of what you're just sort of practicing, iterating, doing over and over again in, um, in your Evolve work and hopefully going forward for you all in your everyday working life is that piece of trying to figure out how to calculate when it's good to leap and when you know that there's a, not, there's a strong enough net underneath you um, that that leap can potentially you know, be a, a, a trampoline that um, sends you onto the next highest peak as opposed to crashing down into the abyss um, along the way. And by doing that, by looking at your numbers, understanding your time, and talking to your customers from the very beginning of your process so that you aren't designing things that are out of reach and getting way too far down um, your own ego's line of what it is that you want to make um, before you make a bad decision and invest in a piece of your work that maybe doesn't have an application that's rational going forward. So, um, part of that is knowing what you're good at. Um, these are really little, but <laughs> I'll tell you what they are. Don't worry about seeing them. Um, so, these are all personality um, tests and quizzes that are all free online. Um, part of what makes our lives interesting is figuring out who you are for yourself in the way that's most effective for you. I have no opinion about what is right for you about understanding yourself um, and what tool is better. I have tried all of these. So this um, is Strengths Finder. Who's heard of Strengths Finder? Um, this is the only one that isn't free, um, but it, um, it categorizes you into four domains of leadership strength. Um, and those are executing, so how well you do stuff, like how do you, you know, not ideating, not making up stuff, but how do you get it done. Influencing, so how much in your life do you influence others. Um, relationship building and strategic thinking. So it's very business oriented, less so than personality oriented. And when you do their little test, um, here's a book about it. Um, I think it's like 15 bucks to get a code to take the test. You end up with 30 different um, words and categories about yourself that help you understand where your strengths are related to executing, influencing, relationship building, and strategic thinking which is kind of helpful um, to know about yourself. If you know that you're weak in executing, for instance, then you need to find people around you who are good executors. If you're only good at the ideas, um, but not good at getting it done, you've got to find um, a part of your team that helps build up that strength side. Um, this is the Enneagram. This is sort of like a, um, <coughs> 70s hippie uh, version of personality stuff. Um, there are nine different personality types that are in their orientation based on what motivates you as a person, like at your gut level. So when you're a kid, were you motivated more by your gut or your heart mm -hmm. or your head? Um, and, you know, again, these are all just tools that I am not recommending that you go out and try, but if you're interested in self-reflection, um, these are fun. Myers-Briggs, who's heard of Myers-Briggs, hopefully almost everybody, I don't know how it's hard to be alive and not have heard of Myers-Briggs at this point, and, <coughs> and it has become so, um, so overdone, and that's the danger in all of these, so I, I you know, please don't think that I'm encouraging you to go believe that there's a silver bullet in one of these things that's going to make your life 100% better. But Myers-Briggs um, sometimes um, I think can be a really negative um, experience for people because some of their categories are um, kind of horrible and <laughs> in the way that they're described. And you know, I, I think 
th there's a challenge sometimes in how those are used and particularly in how human resources <laughs> has um, been um, uh, sometimes willing to use these categories to put people in a box and say, oh, well, you're like this, so we're just going to ignore you over here because you do not fit our mold. So there's some danger. Danger, Will Robinson. So why does an artist want to do that and be fit in a box? I don't, I'll be honest, I've never taken any of these steps. <clears throat> I, I had one, and that was at Berry College. And I thought, I've never had a desire to find out what box I fit into. Um, do you have a desire to find out more about yourself? And how you well, work? Well, <laughs> then there. Then, but, but I mean, I would say personality. I mean, I'm mean, I mean, an artist. I think about themselves as being so different that that they wouldn't. I will tell you this: that what I have learned in this work and being someone who absolutely was trained as a creative, I do not work technically as a creative at all, is that these are all equal for artists. There are as many artists in all no, nine I mean, would an artist, would, if they looked um, at who went and took the test, would, would most many of them Many artists, yes. Uh, I mean, because they're interested in self, in themselves. I mean, we're interested in who we are. We want to know. Not, we don't want to, maybe not want to be put in a box, but I'd like to know more about, like, why I made that mistake 800 <laughs> times over and over again. I just did it last night, and it's kind of fun. <laughs> Which one did you do? Uh... I think it was the one on the far left. Oh, this one is yeah. the um, the the color code. What's it called? No, disc. I can't um, remember. I, yeah. Yeah, it was it was kind of fun. <laughs> I mean, because somebody asked me, they said, "Well, well, what type?" You know, I'm like, I don't know. They're like, I'm sitting there. Like, you got to take this test. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, is this is this me at work or is this me at home? Which one do I right. analyze? You know, because it's two totally different possibilities on there. Well, I think it's good for almost anybody if you're when you're running a business or working at a business, if you know who you are, if you know something about yourself, then it's going to help you in your day to day. It doesn't matter what you do, whether you're going to school or work. If you know what your strengths are and you know what your weaknesses are and you accept that. Then you can. It's a lot easier for you to solve your problems and work well. You know that well, I'm terrible at sales, for example. Then you can find someone to help you with that, or hire someone <coughs> to do that for you instead of making yourself do a terrible job at it. You know. So if you never really take the time to accept who you are and look to try to figure out who you are and what your shortcomings are, it'll it'll harm you down the road one way or another. Well, and it possible. just makes things harder. It does. I mean. And, and I think that's our goal here, too, is to try and make sure that we're maximizing ourselves as much as we can so that we can be productive and happier and enjoying more creative so that we're willing to take more risks because we know we've compensated for some of the things that we're not good at. Cindy? Um, the uh, Clifton Strengths Finder, by the way, there is a new one they have that is strictly for entrepreneurs. It's called the EP, EP10. All right. Very new, um, and a lot of entrepreneurs are now taking this to see what their strengths are, uh, where it lies in what they're doing. Um, I'll make sure to um, add that EP10, right, um, EP10. to the Knowledge Center. So if you're looking for a link, if you can't remember that, I'll have it up there by next week for sure. Thank you, Cindy. I didn't know about that. Look how fast things move. It's crazy. So, Tim, here's your slide. <laughs> So part of our challenge um, that we're going to now <coughs> do a little bit is to um, really talk about where our strengths are and where we live because we've got all three of these little hats that we have to wear um, because the ideas are great, um, but if we can't execute and if we can't manage others um, to help in that execution, then we don't get anywhere and we can throw all of the hats away because we're poor and sad and we have no hats. <laughs> um, if you go to page seven um, in your book, in chapter six, you will see a resource page that talks about um, the critical hats and talking about the entrepreneur. So the entrepreneur hat is, this is the idea person. This is the 
person who likes to solve problems, who um, sees crazy ideas um, in the midst of chaos, and um, they're not always extroverted people. This is not necessarily a salesperson. This is an idea person. Those are two different things. Now, when we think of somebody like Steve Jobs, who obviously had quite a personality and an understanding of sales and marketing that was extraordinary, um, and he also really yelled at people a lot, apparently. Um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a combination of that. So the entrepreneur is not necessarily just a sales-oriented person who is after making the big win. They're actually more interested in solving the problem than in the big win, which is where the problems start to happen. Because what you also need is somebody who's a manager um, who can take that big idea and start to figure out how to make it happen um, by managing people who are involved in your product. And then there's the person who's literally doing the work. So for um, Berea College Crafts, the students are the technicians. Um, everybody who's running um, an area of Berea College Crafts, Crafts has to be in this manager space for sure. They may also be a technician as well. Um, but we haven't been in this space of the entrepreneur as much. Um, and I think that's what we're sort of hoping to do here a little bit is to push ourselves so that we're doing all three of these pieces as the staff people for Berea College Crafts. Um, Tim, for you? I'm all of them. You're all of them, yeah. right? Yeah. Gina, for you too, because it's you and nobody else right now. $100 and, a and for, go ahead, what were you gonna say? I was going to say like 100 hours a week because you, you have to, uh, I don't do a 40 hour week. If it's 2.30 in the morning, I'm in my shop, I'm in my shop. Like this weekend, I probably sent, spent 40 hours in my shop over the weekend, probably Saturday, Sunday. So I mean, you just suck it up and get it done, you know, that's what I do. Or not. And or fail. decide, right. And you fail. Well, no, not necessarily. Because it depends on what it depends on what failure looks for you. Like I can tell you that if I spent forty hours of my weekend every weekend working, I would no longer be um, a good worker. I would um, self destruct as a person because I can't. I know that my brain doesn't work as well. I'm not sleeping as well. I'm stressed in a way that means that I'm not making good decisions anymore for me. So. Um, what that looks like is going to be different for every one of us because we have different tolerance levels, different desires, and we have different strengths in all of these areas. So, you like to work. Well, I like what I do, and that's not really work. All of the above, yeah. yes. See, but I you're used doing, to have a right. job that I did because it was a job, and I don't do that anymore. Now I do what I like to do, so therefore I don't see it as work. Yes, it makes me money, but no, I don't see it as work. Right. It's like, you know, I see these things on Facebook, people post stuff, would you do this tomorrow if it didn't make any money? I would, you know. If you do what you do because you only do it for the money, then that's a job. I mean, that's where I was, and that's not where I'm at now. So you're moving in a better way. Right. that balance. So um, we're going to take this moment to reflect amongst ourselves about our strengths. If you look on page eight, um, this, is, this is not, this is on your own, um, not sharing this part with others. Go ahead and take a look at what, where you think you fit. Are you an entrepreneur, a manager, a technician? Um, are you all three? Where do you fit? Where are your strengths and weaknesses related to those? So take the next five minutes and work through that little exercise.